Hi, and welcome to this edition of City Scene. I'm Sydney Blaine. On this show, we're going to take a step back in time and visit the old historic city jail built in 1929. We're going to speak to a couple of veterans of the police department and speak to one of the first women officers ever sworn to official duty to serve with Phoenix PD. But before then, we're going to get a little historical background with one of the city's historic planners, Bill Jacobson. This is an incredible building. Um, and it was actually built uh, as a joint effort between Maricopa County and the city of Phoenix, is that correct? Uh, that's right. In 1928-29, it was a uh, joint effort. Uh, the two, actually the two buildings were mm -hmm. built by both the city and county governments. Uh, Two-thirds of the building you see is a county courthouse and one-third of it's the city hall. And we're standing in front of the, the county portion right now, which is right on Washington Street, and we're going to step around to the side, which is uh, the City Hall entrance, in just a moment. But first of all, I, I wanted to get a little information on the style of this building, and, and I guess there was a little controversy about the architects as well. Yeah, they um, put out a call for architects, interviewed a number of them. The county ended up selecting uh, Edward Neald, a uh, well-known architect from Shreveport, Louisiana. The city, however, wanted the local firm of Lesher and Mahoney. Mm -hmm. So Neal was selected to do the overall design, and Lesher and Mahoney did the city hall uh, entry, which you'll notice is notably different from the county and the interior of the city hall. And now Lesher, that, that firm was uh, well known here. They did a lot of public buildings, didn't oh, they? Throughout the state of Arizona, yes. And I, I guess uh, it's important to note that 1929, when this opened, it was just just prior to the, the Depression, but this was a huge boom time for, for Phoenix, wasn't it? I mean, a lot of building, a lot of agricultural activity. And uh, it was tremendous. Um, many of our notable buildings were built during that period. The uh, Orpheum Theater over here, uh, just north of us, and the Lures Towers over here were being built at the same time. Uh, some of the more unusual buildings, like the Tobri Castle and the Mystery Castle, mm -hmm. were being built at the same time. Uh, tremendous time in Phoenix. Well, let's take a closer look at the building. You can point out some of the architectural features and uh, the jails, both the county and the city had jails that were in operation and those are on, on the top floors and we'll see those a little bit later. But uh, why don't we take a closer look at the entryway? Okay, All right. sounds good. Bill, just as we're walking around the outside of the building, I just wanted you to point out there's these distinct patterns of the brickwork and the, and the texture is so interesting. Can you give us a little information on that? Well, the uh the building really is kind of divided into some of your classical components. The base of the building, or the foundation level, you'll notice has a very bold pattern in the uh, masonry appearance. It's sort of a running bond with a lot of relief. Then above what the water table line between the first and second stories, you'll notice there's a change in pattern. It's still yes. fairly bold, but it's uh, toned down somewhat. Then you move up to the third floor, and you notice there's what's termed an ashlar, uh, more of a random coursing of stone that doesn't have as much relief. So as you move up, it the texture changes, and then of course you have the detailing on the top of the building. Does this, the, that bit of a scroll work near the, the upper levels uh, right. is an interesting feature? That would be a console. It's a scroll, but a console scroll. They're very prominent on the uh, top of the building, at the top of all the piers. And. Um, is that a type of a, a cornstalk motif that's framing the windows, the, the tile work? Right, the tile and the cast iron metal window surrounds. Uh, it's a, a stylized cornstalk motif with the corn uh, um, head there yes. at the, the center of the window. It's beautiful. Well, we'll take a look at the entryway here for the county side and see how that compares to the city hall side. Okay. Well, Bill, this is such a, a fantastic building now. It must have been just spectacular in 1929. Well, I think it still is. Um, it, it's a wonderful building. The, uh, it really portrays the sort of the power and the sense of, of the city and the county government mm -hmm. with the, sort of the massiveness of the building, which I think is what was intended. Um, here you have the, you know, the classic entry, the granite steps leading to a broad entry that's uh, flanked by uh, well, columns and Well, Madam, swing around and let's see a, a closer look at, at um, the columns you're referring to and the lights. Well, on either side you have again those piers with the consoles at the top, uh, a little more pronounced here, and then there's these wonderful big light fixtures, uh, which are symbolic of arrows. It picks up on the southwestern motif. 
you have the Thunderbird, which is the arrowhead, uh, and then the light fixture itself is actually the arrows at the tail of the shaft on the arrow. And it's fantastic, and that's all iron work? Yes, uh -huh, it's iron and brass. Um, you notice in the central entry there, you have again the cornstalk motif with the little corn finials, the head of the corn on the finial there, and then there's uh, flower, uh, Little grill rosettes, work, rosettes. little rosettes, flowers mm -hmm. with leaves there forming the grill work. And then those little flowers are turned into rosettes up here on the wall of the building and then again up at the top of the building. Well, you know, it's, it's very impressive. And I, I notice um, as we walk around to the City Hall entrance, there's a distinct um, difference. There are, are no Phoenix birds to be found on, on this side of the building. Uh, you, there's a lot of those subtle little differences. You're right on the county courthouse side here, there are no symbols of the phoenix bird uh, yet you move around to the city hall and you find a number of different versions of the phoenix uh, bird rising okay well we'll take a look at the city hall side now and um, point out some of those little subtle differences okay let's do it Well, here we are at 17 South 2nd Avenue, which is Old City Hall. Um, it's been restored, of course, and is now used for various city functions. And I want to point out that the city jail is on top, but it's set back, so we don't really see it from this That's angle. Right. It's top two stories. But um, give us some information about the, the entryway here and how it's, it's really differing so much from the county side. Well, you see, it's, it's set on the face of the building, which is really very similar to the county side, but the entry here really is what you see is the work of Lesher and Mahoney, the local firm. Uh, you have really a smaller entry door, but the way it's done, it has a very massive appearance. The, the massive stone arch with these carved phoenix birds uh, rising out of the flames. Those are fantastic. Uh, yeah, they really are. And then uh, you've got, of course, Phoenix City Hall in relief there. Then above that, you'll notice there's two uh, cartouches that have almost like a city seal that have a phoenix bird with scrolls and then right in the center there as well as over the uh, windows uh, you have a finial that's another uh, form of phoenix bird um, and you see that throughout the, the city hall portion well let's take a closer look at that that door that fantastic heavy door and i i guess it's a uh, copper it's clad, uh, copper clad with bronze uh, rosettes in each of the panels well up close you can see that the door is fantastic the, the workmanship on it uh, t talk a little bit more in detail about some of the uh, entryway features well, you can see the entry, the doors are actually set within this entry arch. You have the terracotta grills flanking either side with the cut marble surround. And the doors themselves are really wonderful. You, they're uh, a bronze clad with the uh, large uh, brass rosettes uh, or medallions in each panel. And then there's the little flowered rosettes uh, that surround them. Um, you mentioned too that um, the upper part of the door has been sealed. And uh, well, I want you to show it in just a moment that it was sealed for what reason? Well, these doors are really quite massive. They're very heavy. And uh, apparently at some point in the past, we don't know exactly when, they cut the top two panels off oh. the doors. And uh, Yeah, we want to give us, show us. Here. You'll notice there's hinges at the top there that don't operate anymore. And when you open the door, just the bottom two panels open, which is still actually quite massive and heavy. They're, so real, they're just really in order wonderful. For a normal person to open this door. <laughs> yeah, it'd take, a lot, it'd take a lot of work and uh, considerably more, I think, with the rest of those panels up there. Now, you, you had a story you relate about finding this incredible light fixture uh, buried somewhere in the building. Uh, when they were doing the uh, restoration work, they actually, they found this light fixture in the, uh, in the basement. And we know from original drawings and photographs that this is where it hung. It had been taken down at some point. Of course, it's been completely refurbished, but it's uh, heavy uh, uh, wrought iron and brass. Uh, you'll also see, again, little phoenix birds up mm -hmm. there all around the top of it. Yeah, it's, um, it's incredible. Well, we'll go inside the massive doors now and, and see the inside, which is really beautiful, lined with, with marble, quite different from the county oh, side. Yeah, it's wonderful. Okay. So, Bill, this is really a fantastic um, motif here on the floor. It's a, it's a brass, is that it's, made of brass? It's a Pittsburgh? brass uh, plaque set in the floor. And of course, it's another, uh, again, representation of the rising phoenix bird. And 
This is, you can see how it's worn from so many years of people walking over it. But it's a, a beautiful plaque, and then it's surrounded with the tile mosaic with various ge uh, geometric symbols around it. And, and then, then the, like sun rays. Like right? sun rays radiating from that in the marble in the floor. And of course, all these different marble materials that you see here came from really different places around the world. On the wall here, you have a, a light colored Italian marble with a rust and a black variegation running through it. Um, that same marble is used around on the door surrounds and on the moldings, but it's been cut at a different angle, which mm -hmm. creates a little different pattern there. Little details like the around the floor, you have a, a black band that's a, a Belgian marble. On the floor here, the gray floor that I believe is a Tennessee marble. So they've mixed all these different materials to really impress you with the. And I am impressed. <laughs> and I wanted to point out, you said these are original light fixtures up here in the center of the corridor. Right. The ones in the center here are original, and again, they're they're brass fixtures, and they incorporate a, again a phoenix bird. Matter of fact, uh, there are even red flames. Uh, that the bird is rising from on those fixtures. Um, and then, of course, there's the brass uh, dedication uh, plaques on the wall here, one of the Phoenix volunteer firemen, um, and then, of course, the mayor and council at the time the building was built. I want to thank you so much. It's been great just seeing all the, you know, getting the background historically and architecture in front of you. You're going to tour the city jail a little bit later on. And uh, that's going to be a marked contrast from all of this uh, opulence. But well, thank you so much, Bill. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And joining us earlier for more on this story, Lieutenant Mike Nicolin, curator for the Phoenix Police Museum. Now, sure. as I said, this was a combination, police department and city hall. And as so we're looking at, at some of these floors. Can you give us an idea of, of, of what mm -hmm. was housed where? Well, initially, the police radio was very, you know, there wasn't very many people involved then. Uh, the force was very small um, in the early 30s. Mm -hmm. And so they had it in the basement of 17 South 2nd Avenue. And some of the main part of the building was occupied by City Hall and the council and so forth. Uh, later on, as the years progressed, the police department took over all the building and City Hall moved to a new building. And this building then had the first floor housed with uh, radio communications, the front desk. So if you had a complaint or uh, you needed to make contact with a police officer, you went in under these steps into the front desk area. And this is where we see the line of trees. That's considered Correct. the first floor of the, the Correct. radio room. And then you made contact with the police at that time at that location. And how about on the next floor, which would be considered the second floor? Okay, most of that on this side was our records and identification bureau. Uh, you would go in from the second floor here and you go right into the right uh, entry area and that's where you would you know, run checks on people, uh, backgrounds on vehicles and so forth. And on the other side, the left side, was uh, the detective bureau. Okay. And weren't there actually city courtrooms, the few, one or two we courtrooms? We had one courtroom. One courtroom. Which was in the basement, off to the left side over here. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, made our arrest the night before, the following morning, we would bring them down the stairwell, and uh, they would go into the cell, which was part of the courthouse in our one section over there, and we would bring them to the judge at that time, the following morning. We made our own arrests, and then we booked our own prisoners in the city jail, and then um, these were all misdemeanors, and then we would bring them to court, and then if they were convicted, then they would go out to the compound out by the airport, uh, which was also manned by the city. Now, what was the capacity? I mean, we're going to see some shots of the interior of the jail. It's interesting because it's still that really unusual color of green. I guess it was painted regularly. Oh, yes. And, um, the capacity probably was around 200 to 300 prisoners at any one time. It wasn't a very large jail, uh, just large enough for us to accommodate the prisoners we had during that time period. Now, I just wanted to comment that we're hearing a lot of um, ambient noise because this is a very active pedestrian walkway, and of course, we're just off of Washington Street, so we are hearing sirens yeah. and traffic, and the actual police department is located just down the street. 
Um, as far as, again, going back to the jail, you said the, the main um, the crime, I guess, that most of the people committed that were arrested was for, for being drunk and disorderly? Drunk and disorderly and in vagrancy. There, we had a law then that doesn't exist today, and drunk and disorderly doesn't exist today either. But during that time, in the 60s, early 60s, and up through the early 70s, it did. And uh, we arrested a lot of people for that. And uh, they would spend the night, and then we'd be, you know, we'd kick them loose the following morning. So. You know, as you walk up there, I mean, of course, we can't really do justice to this, but there's a really a distinct odor. I mean, it's, it really oh, yeah. smells awful. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just from years of, of use and lack of circulation, but it, it must have been a pretty tough job doing duty up there. Yes, yes, it was. Um, a lot of it is because of the age of the complex. It's uh, pretty well condemned on that floor because it's got lead-based paint and uh, it's just too cost prohibitive to repair and change all that. You made an interesting comment before that no one has ever escaped and that there's a very um, unusual mix of materials used for the interior bars on the jail cells. Correct. Talk, ab talk about that for a moment. Some, some of the um, material that was used in there was nickel and it's almost impossible to cut through that along with some other ingredients that were used that um, people that may have walked away because they were trustees and let out to do the errands and things like that did escape. Uh, we had one that uh, got out of the main cell area but was caught before they got anywhere. Uh, but those, those areas are so confining and controlled that it's impossible to get out of it. Um, we're going to go look around the corner at the loading dock okay. uh, to see actually where prisoners were unloaded and talk a little bit about how you got the transfer uh, going up to the top floor. Sure, that's called the chute. All right, the yeah. chute. We're going to take sure. a look at the chute. All right. All right. So, Mike, this is the chute, the famous chute. This is chute it. Where all the well, the big bad guys went through here. Okay. That's right. Yeah, sure. Normally, we would br bring our wagons up here and back them up. Mm -hmm and then we would unload prisoners. And most, like I said before, were either drunks or vagrants. And um, some of them were obviously bigger than me. Wouldn't be too big, but bigger than me. And, and when bringing them in here, they would be falling down and you would just be working by yourself most of the mm -hmm. time, bringing them in. As a single officer? A lot of times, yes, really? single officers. Well, you know, there's really not much security here. I mean, it's straight off of Jefferson Street. It's fairly wide open. Even now, in, in modern times, Correct. it was probably less secure then. What kind of problems did you have? Well, you'd end up, uh, if you get one prisoner that's combative, and you'd have to fight him. Uh, you didn't have portable radio, so you would fight him for a while and then hold him down and just wait. And you'd wait for somebody to come by to help you. Hopefully another officer would come by, because you don't have any radio communications. Your radio's in your car. And so you just make the best of it. And you mentioned something else that's not a, certainly not, not one of the perks of the, of the job, that if some of the prisoners were ill from being so drunk, they might uh, be getting sick on you. Oh, yes, yes. It happened many times. When you, in wagon situations, there were always two men officers, and they would come through the, the gates and the doors, mm -hmm. and they would have all their prisoners with them. And usually, they weren't standing on their own, and if they didn't get sick in the wagon, they got sick when they got out of the wagon because probably the way we drove. But then they would get sick on us. And um, you didn't finish your shift like that. You usually changed your shirt, but you had to endure that for a little while before you could get to that point. <laughs> and you said that um, upstairs that when it got uh, dirty or if it prisoners got sick, there was yeah. just painting yeah. always yeah. over the dirt. There's always a sign up that said, Every time I booked someone in the jail here, there was always a paper sign that said, wet paint. And you'd go in there, well, your prisoners are not real helpful, and they're falling down drunk, most of them, and they end up pushing you against the paint, and you get a paint stripe or two on your shirt. Well, that's just the way it goes. It's too bad. <laughs> very, very bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah but a little vomit just, and fresh paint never hurt anybody. So. Exactly.
Uh, these are the stairs that we would bring the prisoners up when the jail elevator was broken. They were much narrower then and uh, a little Ooh. difficult to negotiate with an unruly prisoner. Welcome to Historic City Jail. And that was a voice of Kent Keller, uh, who spent 27 years as a Phoenix police officer. Booked many a prisoner in here, didn't you? Many a prisoner, I'll say. Well, you can give us a tour through the, through the area. Um, it's pretty much intact as it was since 1929. And I suppose it was considered a quite a state-of-the-art facility in those it was, days. It was that. And uh, very few, even attempt escapes, were made from this facility. Uh, there are several things that you remember as you come up here that I remember well, the color of the paint. Uh, luckily, the odors of the place are gone now, but... Uh, and the crying and the, probably crying, the sobbing. And almost always you were greeted by the crying or yells of unruly prisoners, and things of that nature. Well, I'm going to be your unruly prisoner, and I'm going to let you take us through the steps of what would happen um, coming in and being booked here at the city jail. Okay, well, we would come through the electric mm -hmm. door, which is at the front of this hall, right. and come around the corner, and we would lead you down this short hall and to the booking area. I know that I'm just a prisoner, but this looks like the whole of a ship. It's all metal and rivets. On, I mean, it's That's true. It's a very solid facility. This was made to last and made to protect both the prisoners and the officers involved. We would lead you here to the booking bars and have you put your hands on these bars. Mm -hmm. At this point, there was a desk here, and the booking officer would begin asking you questions to fill out the forms mm -hmm. while the arresting officer would search you. Now, if mm -hmm. you're a female, mm -hmm you would be searched by the nurse matron. Uh, regular males, the officers would search themselves. And we do have a photo of this. Actually, it was a whole enclosed desk area. And yes, it's a, uh, a shot to show. quite a place. Uh, the photo shows the screen here across the top, but there was a time when there was no screen, and this allowed the booking personnel to come across and assist you if you had a really terribly unruly prisoner. But you would search them here, the order here was don't take your hands from the bars. Mm -hmm. If the hand came off the bars, then it was forcibly brought back. Because at this point, hopefully, you had already searched him downstairs, but again, you search him here in case he had secreted a weapon or something, and you made sure that he was a safe prisoner. And from this point, Kent, um we're going to go into to being identified. Right. After you were processed at the booking desk, we would go ahead and take your arm again yeah. and lead you into the processing area for the I identification section. Well, Kent, I must say that even though I'm not an official prisoner, I, I'm feeling really confined right now, and well, I'm no. not feeling really happy. And I, this room really is a what? lot bigger than some of the rooms you'll be in. Uh, this grip that I have on your elbow here is kind of a typical grip because uh, with your thumb right above the elbow joint, mm -hmm. should you tense up to take any action, I can feel that with my thumb. And so I just wanted to, to react. To, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm docile now. <laughs> okay, very good. This area had a screen across the uh, electrical box, mm -hmm. and this was where you would be photographed. Okay, the so the number. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. The camera right. would be back here, and you would have numbers in mm -hmm. front of you. Mm -hmm which helped identify the arrest number and uh, the date. And fingerprinting. And then after that, we would bring you over here. Now, this desk is gone now, but it ran all along this L shape in the room, and here you would be fingerprinted. Now, the law gave us the right to fingerprint you forcibly if you decided you didn't want to be. Usually, though, by this point, mm -hmm. uh, people were resigned to the fact that they were in jail and it would behoove them to behave themselves. <laughs> well, let's just say I'm protesting my stay here. Um, is there a, an isolation uh, cell nearby? Oh, yes. All right, let's take a look. Okay. Okay, we would bring you over here to the isolation tank. I have a feeling I don't want to be in here very long. I don't think you want to be here very long, no. These tanks are completely devoid of any anything other than a toilet. Yes, uh, there are no amenities in here. There's not even a light fixture. No light, no holes anywhere where you could uh, attach a rope if you, or a belt if you wanted to cause yourself harm. 
the light came in from outside here uh, through the screen in the catwalk, and that was the only light. I was taking a closer look at that screen because you were mentioning that it's a, it's a fine mesh. Very fine mesh screen. Uh, had you managed to get a blade this far, a knife blade or something, there's no way you could get through. And also, it being fine mesh, very difficult to fit through. Fitting would have been a problem, I suppose. Yeah, it, uh, not as much as it is now. Now, uh, Certainly of course, it has a, diseases, yes. a lot of medical reasons before it was a real irritant. How long would someone be um, confined in an isolation cell like this? It would depend on how their attitude changed. Mm -hmm. This is a real attitude changer, this mm -hmm. little cell. Uh, sometimes it only took an hour, sometimes three or four hours. Sometimes I've seen them stay here as long as 24 hours. Well, I'm, I'm ready to leave now. I, I'm ready to go to the general population. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe you've earned trustee status by now. <laughs> How about the drunk tank? The drunk tank. Shall we uh, go and take a look at that? Yes, let's right, go take a look at that. This is the door that leads from the booking area and ID section into the main part of the jail itself. And this is the last view of the outside world for the prisoner until he was released by the court and the last sound he hear. Well, another heavy metal door that further segregates prisoners from the, the real world. It, what is this, actually, this, this, uh, this mechanical operation? And These are the controls for the cell doors, and stations like this exist throughout the facility. They were operated by hand. Ooh, you can hear those cells closing. Yeah, that's another sound that will remain with you. They can be locked in an open position or locked in a closed position, or you can decide which of the cells you want to open and pull those controls. Well, let's, let's demonstrate and take a shot of these cell doors. Okay. Whoa, that does reverberate. What is this section? Right? This, this is the trustee section where the prisoners who had shown good behavior mm -hmm. and were working for the city in certain capacities, they had their own special unit. Oh, so this would be A accommodations, the, uh, the, class the high class accommodations, I see. Class A accommodations, usually two to a cell, sometimes three. You can see the remains where the bunks were, these arms sticking out, and the toilet facility, and these cells were usually lit from outside in this area and the light coming in from the... Uh, yes, it's not quite as claustrophobic, but this um, institutional shade of green, why? Is there a reason that all these types of facilities are this awful That's, shade of green? They must have got a real deal on green <laughs> paint. You pointed out something before that I thought was interesting, but that these um, bars are practically virtually impossible to saw through or sort of escape from. I mean, this is solid. Metal with, with this nickel? is nickel steel, mm. and, and then it has a bar, probably of tungsten down it, which is ultra hard. So uh, it would take quite a bit. Uh, a normal hacksaw couldn't saw through that. So this was essentially home for your trustees, this, this area, and, and how many trustees would be here at any one time? Uh, usually 10, 12, mm -hmm. sometimes 15, mm -hmm. and the cell doors here were very seldom locked. They were left open so they could wander out in the eating area and the bench area. And they were given far more freedom than a uh, run-of-the-mill prisoner. I see that there's a bit of um, a, a catwalk uh, running along parallel the length of this area. And maybe we'll take a, just a little walk down here. And does this lead to the drunk tank? Right. This okay. will lead you around to the uh, east side of the jail where the drunk tank is located. This catwalk completely surrounds all the, the cell facilities. You know, Kent, this long catwalk is so eerie and, and so dramatic. I mean, it really looks like you're on a, on a film set, which, um, of course, I'm expecting the scene between Scagney or at least Al Capone, but this was the real thing, obviously, an active jail, and I'm sure quite miserable for all, all the inhabitants that were here. It what was, especially on the trustee side. It was not comfortable, but mm -hmm. as close to comfort as a, as a mm -hmm. jail can be. 
we're in the catwalk area here, and you can see a groove cut down the length of the catwalk. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, allowed the uh, jail personnel to wash out the area rather than have to sweep it every time, and they would wash it out. It would run into this groove and down to the drains that were positioned at both ends. And it's so narrow. I mean, it, it's really just uh, room for a, a, a really a person at a time. Why is it so narrow? It's quite confining, all right. But if you put your back to the wall, you'll notice that you're almost an arm's length away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if somebody reached through to grab you, they could the jail personnel could take a hold of that arm and control the person pretty easily. Mm, security. Well, let's. Um, Let's continue on because I think the drunk tank is around the corner. Drunk tank's around the corner. All right. Kent, I feel like we're actually doing some time together here. <laughs> That's true. Isn't it? As you'll notice, that this is a place of bars, but it's also a place of doors. Doors mm -hmm. everywhere to seal off certain sections. Just to make it all that more secure. And the famous drunk tank right here. This is the infamous drunk tank. This is, um, again, you know, we're seeing it completely empty, but about how many people would be here on a typical Saturday night? A typical Saturday night, you might have upwards to 100 people here. people in this room? And in this room. Uh, and, and what kind of accommodations were, were in here? I mean, well, there's no bunks uh, that I see of. You're looking at the accommodations. Uh, these large metal plates along the wall here are actually bunks that, that can be let down. However, uh, it was much better not to let them down because mm -hmm. people could uh, roll off and hurt themselves. So large mats were laid on the floors. Mm -hmm. And when you were brought in here, depending on your condition, you just found a place on the mat, and that was it until you were called for court. And it must have been a really miserable place to be. It was a lot of groaning, moaning, crying, abusive language, everything went on. We're going to see the other wing of the jail, which I believe um, housed some felony, felony prisoners? Felony prisoners and long timers, okay. we called them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Kent, I just wanted to acknowledge you for all of the wonderful photographs you've taken. I mean, you're a commercial photographer now, and uh, you've really done a, quite a job of documenting this facility. Well, it, it helps to have a feel for something like this. Uh, if it's part of my history, then it's a little easier to have a feeling to document it. Uh, it and came out very well. And I appreciate that you've uh, given us permission to use the various photos we've seen throughout this piece um, of, of the jail, the interior of the jail. Uh, this area that we're at right now, this, you said, was uh, the tank for long-term prisoners? These were the long-term prisoners. Prisoners that were sentenced to a term of one year or more went directly to the county. Mm -hmm. However, less than a year they were housed here. And were, there were also felons uh, housed here. Felons were correct? housed here prior to court appearances mm -hmm. on the other side. Now, I know there's a, a woman's jail upstairs, and of course, one of the most famous uh, inmates was Winnie Ruth Judd, although I understand she wasn't here very long before she was transferred to the county. But right. she was actually booked into jail here upstairs, correct? That's right. And Ernesto Miranda was a frequent guest, I understand, of oh, yes. the city jail. He graced our, our doors many times. Mm -hmm. um, we want to get a shot of this uh, individual cell here because we have an opportunity to get a close-up. This, again, is um, the long-term prisoner cell. Right, this would be long-term or a holding cell for a felony prisoner prior to a court appearance. Uh, again, there would have been one bunk in this cell. You can see the bracket marks where it was along the wall, and possibly a second one up above. It looks like in this cell there's a possibility of a third set of brackets, whether those are another bunk or not, I'm not sure. But they're very plainly furnished. This is not a country club. Well, Kent, from here, we're going to go speak with Jeanette Reed, who was one of the very first female officers sworn in for duty with the Phoenix Police Department in 1957. But um, I've really enjoyed this time here that you've spent with us, and I know it's a very grim and solemn place, and I can hardly imagine what it was like um, having, having duty up here for all those years. What are some of your final impressions of the old city jail? 
Well, it does bring back fond memories and uh, some not so fond as well, mm -hmm. but it is a, a real place in history. And I'm sure if the walls could talk, we'd hear some real stories. Well, thanks for the use of your wonderful photographs. And uh, I've enjoyed my time behind bars and I want to use my get out of jail pass right now. Okay, just follow me. Thank you. Jeanette Reed now volunteers as chief researcher for the Phoenix Police Museum, but she was among the first of four women officers to be hired to serve with Phoenix PD. In 1957, I was, became a sworn police officer of Phoenix, and uh, I stayed until 1975, and I went out with an injury, but I had enough credits for 20 years. We, we did have a disadvantage. They did not know what to do with us. Being women, women did not wear trousers or pants in those days. And they decided that we should design our own and, and have our own uniform. So we came out with 10 weight Metcalf wool jacket and skirt, and we had to wear a white shirt with string ties. And a really peculiar, <laughs> funny hat that looked like a stray Japanese streetcar conductor's hat and we had to wear high heel shoes, and we had a 40-pound purse. And in that purse was bullets, gun, a small nightstick, our mace, everything that pertained to being a police officer, including our gun, and it did weigh 40 pounds. And it was an excruciating thing at about the fifth hour of the day. We, we talked a little bit about the era of you know, the, the historic jail and what the, the conditions were like. And, and it would just give us a little information. You said, you know, it was really um, saving lives at that time. There were so many people yes. that you guys were picking up in the streets. We, actually, the city of Phoenix is what I call, we, we really did save a lot of people's lives. And it, we were mostly uh, picking up drunks and vagrants from the street. And it was a time that we didn't have uh, a lot of employment and there was a lot of them hanging around in what we call the deuce area. In the early 50s up into the 1960s, the deuce area was called the deuce because it was the produce area and it was on 2nd Street. And the produce area was over on Madison and some of these um, vagrant type people would go over to look for jobs every day at the produce at the docks. And when they didn't find a job, they would wind back up over on the Deuce where all the, uh, you might call the flea bag hotels and the uh, bars and things where that type of people congregated. And uh, I walked down there and I felt like that I never got into really serious trouble because of the friends or impressions that I made on the people in jail from having been a nurse. And there were a couple of people down there that were very big men, a couple of twin Indian people. And whenever I looked like I was even thinking of having a, a bit of trouble, they would say, what do you want to do? What, what do you want us to do with him, Officer Reed? Yeah, <laughs> it was not the best duty to have. It was very poor working conditions. The jail was overcrowded. There was no doubt about that. It was not built for the number of people that we had to take care of. And when they came in as ill as they were, if they were, if they were drunk and on the verge of just throwing up, they did, and it didn't matter where it landed. If it was on you, well, oh well, uh, you were there, you know. But uh, you learn how to dodge really quickly. And uh, they did have some pretty bad fights in the jail. We always had to separate them. And Maybe there was two degrees some fondness or concern or compassion or affection. Um, on the part of you towards this kind of lost souls, you know, that you all would pick up, you know, and talk oh, about yes. that. Oh, you, yes, you, uh, you have to have the milk of human kindness. You cannot uh, have that taken away, and, and among nurses and police officers, that exists. And if it wasn't that way, well, then I, I would say that we would have had a very poor department. But we had a very excellent department. We still do. 
If you'd like more information on Historic City Jail, contact the Phoenix Police Museum at 602-534-7278.